Today, we are looking into a more advanced form of fuzzing than what we have seen before. We are looking into so-called mutation-based fuzzing. What's the thing with mutation-based fuzzing? If you use totally random characters, as we would have, say, in the Bart Miller style of fuzzing, we will find bugs, but the large majority of your inputs will simply be invalid. <clears throat> that is, they will be rejected already by the parser of your program, meaning that they're great for finding bugs in the parser, but not so much in finding bugs in the actual functionality because <clears throat> they rarely reach this functionality. So one idea <clears throat> to get more valid inputs is, well, to have a specification of what a valid input means. This means to have a grammar or a similar description. These are things that we're going to look into later on. Today, however, we're looking at another method to generate more valid inputs. Namely, rather than simply creating or steering of random characters from scratch, we're taking existing inputs, existing valid files, and these existing valid files would then be mutated that is, we throw in small changes to these files such that um, we still get a higher coverage in our program and have a chance to find more bugs. Because if we do small changes to our valid files in the first place, the chances of them still being valid is high, yet we have a means to achieve diversity. Here is an example from our chapter on mutation-based fuzzing. So what we have here is a couple of mutations from an original URL. So here you have uh, HTTP google.com search fuzzing. And <clears throat> here we have a couple of mutations in here. And you see that these are all small variants on the original string. And what you also find in here, yes, for instance, we have a variation over here that actually puts in a caret where a colon would be. We have a different, we have HTTPF dot a colon as a protocol and other things, HTTP, whatever that means. And of course, also various changes on the right hand side, some with queries, some with uh, hashtags in here. And all these things actually, uh, <clears throat> actually trigger different parts in a URL processing program, such as a URL parser that takes such a string and decomposes it into its individual constituents. So <clears throat> how do we do this? This is actually also the base or the base principle of the super popular and super, uh, super efficient uh, American fuzzy lob fuzzer, also known as AFL. AFL is, uh, one can easily say, the by far uh, most frequently used fuzzer these days in particular as it comes to practical programs. AFL uses starts with a seed of inputs and mutates these in a similar fashion that we have currently seen. And it is very efficient at all that. So um, the first thing we are uh, introducing here in this chapter is actually the idea of mutating inputs. We do have functions to delete individual characters from the input. So if we have a string like uh, a quick brown fox in here, uh, then we get uh, variations, a quick, brown f a quick brow fox, a quick brown fox, a quick brown ox. Oh, that's interesting. What would a quick brown ox be? A quick brown ox jumps over the lazy field. Well, we'll find that out. <laughs> and uh, other variations, and every, everywhere a character is deleted. We also have insertions of random characters, say, um, say, um, here we have an at character being inserted. Here we have a zero character being inserted. And we also have flipping random characters. That is, we take a random bit out of our character and exchange it. So we take an 8-bit representation of characters, take any bit, turn it around. And this also allows us to create, uh, to replace characters with other characters. Here, for instance, we have replaced um, a space character with a dollar sign. And this is now something that we can put into a function that um, takes a string and actually replaces it and actually applies a mutation. And then we run this a couple of times and then we get arbitrary mutations in our strings. 
And uh, this is, of course, now something that we can actually apply on our that we can actually apply on our inputs. And of course, we can also apply multiple mutations one after the other. And here you can see that after 45 mutations in a row, uh, the original string is hardly recognizable. So what do we do with all these mutated inputs? Well, um, first of all, well, we can just create them and seed them into our put them into our program under test. But we can be smarter than that. Notably, we can actually we can actually get feedback from the program in order to guide our mutations. For this, we can make use of the coverage feature, the coverage class that we introduced in the previous chapter to determine the trace, that is the set or more precisely the set of locations, the coverage that was uh, covered by each of our inputs. And then we maintain a population of inputs and say 20 inputs or so, can also be much bigger. And then for each of these inputs, we determine their coverage. And if two inputs have the same coverage, that is, they exercise exactly the same lines in the program, then we go and um, do not add a new member to a population if it already has existing coverage. We only add new members to our population if they give us new coverage. So that's one thing. The second thing is we actually do not only mutate our original inputs, we actually mutate our mutate and evolve our population, individual members of our population again and again. And this results in a scheme where we're having a population of inputs and then we're taking and we keep on applying mutations, we keep on evolving them. And in order to achieve a population that has a maximum diversity in terms of coverage achieved. And if we have a big diversity in coverage achieved, then we also get high chances to actually find bugs in there. So this is what we're building in here. We're building a class mutation fuzzer that um, applies this particular technique. So it takes a seed and it takes a range of uh, mutations to apply minimum number, maximum number. And the seed is a list of input strings that should be mutated. And um, it uh, picks a candidate by, by mutating a population member. And it's simply good. And the idea now is to have this guided by coverage so we introduce a class named function runner that actually runs an individual function. And then we have function coverage runner, which not only runs an individual function, but also captures its coverage. And uh, this is something that we can now apply on arbitrary functions, such as a URL parser, in order to not only, not only execute it, but also get its coverage out. And now we can introduce a mutation coverage fuzzer that applies the scheme as, as detailed before. We have a population and we keep on evolving it. And um, every time we reach new coverage, we add an input to a population and we add its co coverage to the population coverage. And this is something that we can easily run. And in the end, we can look up the population. Here we do have a population. Here we're looking at a population of something around 20 inputs. And now the nice thing here again is that not only are these all mutations of our original input, but the nice thing is each of these inputs has a different coverage that is uh, that is triggers different parts of the program. And uh, this, of course, uh, leads to a high diversity in our population, which makes this a nice set of inputs for fuzzing. Such uh, mutation guided fuzzers uh, are typically run for hours and hours. The typical evaluation settings let them run for 24 hours in a row. And that's for a reason. Even though these mutations applied are small, the actual percentage of valid inputs in there also still is small. So it takes quite some time with plenty of small mutations to actually achieve new coverage and also take some time to find, to find deeply hidden bugs. But um, 
overall, the nice thing about this approach is its versatility. It's, 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 it's versatility. You need nothing. You need no information about the program at hand. All you need to know is how to run it with some input and how to get back the coverage afterwards. You can apply this on arbitrary programs. And if you have a large range of programs, yes, you can easily fuzz them all day and night. Let some big machine simply fuzz them for a week or so. And this gives you high chances to actually find bugs in them. Um, in con this is actually in contrast to the more specification-based or to the more language-based approaches we'll be looking at later in this later in this book, because um, these actually assume that you know something about the programs you're fuzzing, and that is you know what their input language looks like. And of course, if you know that, then it's great to put this into, uh, then it's great to make use of this just as well. This actually gives us a nice separation of the perspectives of security researchers and software engineers. Software, in software engineering, if you do fuzzing, you typically fuzz your own programs. So you know their code, you know their input language. It's just a matter of making sure that the fuzzer can make use of all, but generally the assumption is you're testing your own program. In security, we are more to, we are more like taking an adverse position. That is, the program we are fuzzing is a program that comes from someone else. So we don't know, we know nothing. We don't assume too much. We simply assume we can run it on some input. But other than that, all we're looking at is finding bugs with the lowest manual effort possible because we don't want to go into big re-engineering efforts. So we just throw a fuzzer at it and let the fuzzer run for days and nights. And um, this is exactly what penetration testers do, among others, uh, running fuzzers day and night in the hope of finding the one bug that will allow them to <clears throat> that will allow them to actually um, exploit some vulnerability and get control over the program at hand. Yeah. And mutational based fuzzers, fuzzers like AFL, are exactly the right tool for that. So if you haven't done this yet, try this out for yourself, either with the code in the book or by running AFL proper. Enjoy.